you're a high achieving and ambitious person who struggles with their sleep, this video is jam packed with practical, useful, and delightfully counterintuitive advice about how to get your sleep back on track. My name is Nick Wignall. I'm a clinical psychologist and I specialize in sleep and insomnia. And I'm chatting today with my friend, Dr. Daniel Erickson, who is also an expert in sleep and insomnia issues. It's a fast paced conversation where Daniel and I trade off our best suggestions and advice for high achieving striver types who are tired of kind of superficial, silly sleep advice, sleep hygiene tips, stuff like that, and really want to do the work to get their sleep back on track for good. We cover things like what to do if you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't fall back asleep. The problem with sleep hygiene, a really simple but powerful exercise for managing worries and sleep anxiety, and bombshell, the best of all, why it is totally okay to watch TV in bed, even if you have insomnia. Enjoy. Daniel Erickson, welcome. So glad to be here, Nick. Excited. Yeah, I'm super excited to chat today. We're going to talk about better sleep for high achievers. And the reason I took this topic or kind of angle on the, the sleep question is, you know, when I, I specialized in insomnia when I was in my practice, and it didn't take long for me to realize that a lot of the people come through my door <laughs> to work on sleep and insomnia, they all kind of fit the same personality profile, which I'm sure you've seen too, which is very high achieving, very ambitious, very goal oriented, extremely hardworking, and just generally very successful in a lot of areas of their life. But then they had this one, this like pebble in their shoe, <laughs> maybe bolder, depending on how bad their sleep problems were but they were just having a really hard time sleeping, struggling with a lot of insomnia. And I think this gets to something that's near and dear to both of our hearts, which is the, what I call the, the paradox of sleep effort, which is sleep is one of these weird things in life. Most things in life are very amenable to effort and problem solving and trying harder. That's how we solve things. But sleep is one of these things where that approach totally backfires. <laughs> it gets worse and worse and worse the harder you try uh, to improve your sleep. And so I thought it would be fun to have you on and we can both kind of share some of our experiences and advice when it comes specifically to helping people who are, who fit this uh, category of kind of high achievers. I think of them as strivers, strive, people who are really, really good at striving towards things who tend to have this vulnerability when it comes to sleep. So anyway, that's kind of the frame. And I would love to kind of kick things off with your first kind of tip or suggestion. So what do you got for us? You know, when you when you mentioned this idea, I was like, oh, that sounds great. And I've, I've made the same observations as you have. And in fact, I was, you know, as I was preparing for this this podcast, I was like, OK, let me think about kind of the sticking points for this this, you know, group of, of people that we help. And I was like, I was trying to imagine, you know, the the avatar. And I was like, it's kind of everyone, like everyone, almost everyone in my practice actually fits this avatar. So like just, you know, highlighting what you just said. But yeah, the first one I wrote down. The first kind of tricky situation that the 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 typical client with insomnia has is perfecting their sleep hygiene. Mm. I see that all the time. And I think, you know, most of the people tuning in here will know what sleep hygiene is. But for those of you who don't, sleep hygiene is basically sort of a laundry list of do's and don'ts that supposedly helps you sleep. And these are things like, you know, keep the room cool and dark and, you know, don't exercise before you go to bed. Don't eat too much before you get. Avoid spicy food. Don't drink coffee, et cetera, et cetera. That, those type of, of, of advice are known collectively as sleep hygiene. Now, there's, of course, some, some commonsensical things about that that, that, you know, that apply to all human beings. None of us like to sleep in a room that is like super hot with like a disco ball. And like, you know, so, so, so of course, like, I, I think everyone, you know, benefits from approaching this with common sense. But... The high achiever who's had some trouble sleeping often does the following. They see that, they, they read online that the ideal temperature for your bedroom is like 63.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And they set, you know, their, they, they, set, they, they set the temperature to that. They, they have blackout curtains, you know, and a sleep mask and like, and make their bedroom basically like a sensory deprivation chamber. They, they follow every single thing on a laundry list again of sleep hygiene things. And to your point, the more effort that is put in in this way, the more struggle they have. So the first thing uh, I wrote down was like perfecting sleep hygiene. Hmm. Yeah, which is that, that kind of perfectionism, that strain of perfectionism is really common in this this personality type. I, I definitely fall into this this category. I'm, I'm certainly guilty of that. So talk a little bit about like, so what's the problem, right? That, that Well, if there are these sleep hygiene things are generally good for our sleep, like why not try and perfect them and get them all perfectly right. Like what's the, <laughs> why not? That sounds good, right? It's intuitive. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, you bring up a great point, which is, you know, I often get the question of like, Hey, Daniel, like, 
a lot of my friends, they, you know, they improve their sleep hygiene and they're sleeping better. So why shouldn't I do that? Why isn't it helping me? Right. And to me, the answer to that is that, you know, their friend really were not scared of not sleeping. There wasn't really an element of like fear of being awake. You know, that, that wasn't there. That, that, that friend of theirs was just like, ah, oh, I'm not sleeping as well as I could. Maybe I should do this, do a little change here. And they felt good about the change, but there was no more pondering or reflection or no effort. So the tricky thing is that the high achiever who's had some trouble sleeping and now identifies this as a problem and thinks like, oh no, I'm not sleeping enough. I'm not sleeping well enough. I'm not sleeping long enough. They approach sleep hygiene in a problem-solving manner. They think they have a problem with sleep mm. that needs to be addressed and fixed. So they start with, for example, you know, making sure it's really dark. And they approach this as an kind of experiment and they self-monitor and they go like, oh, it's dark now. Am I going to sleep more? And that alone makes this person kind of a little bit anxious and they have more trouble sleeping. But instead of going like, oh, you know, making my bedroom dark, that didn't really help. So now I'm going to abandon this. This per perfectionist, if you will, or striver goes like, I'm not doing enough. I have to do another thing. And they mm. go into like, oh, now I have to get rid of all the sound. And the same thing happens. And they're like, oh, I'm still not doing enough. And then it just snowballs. And the more they try, the more struggle they have with sleep. And then this becomes kind of, kind of a, a really vicious cycle. So that, that's the problem there. Yeah, it's so counterintuitive because that that effort, while well-intentioned, and even the thing itself, like blackout curtain, sure. Like, I'm sure that's somewhat helpful, right, for sleep. I, I'm not going to say that's not helpful. The problem is, is it helpful along with all the side effects that come from being perfectionistic about getting it right. All of the, the effort and anxiety, which leads to arouse, which is the exact opposite of what you need for sleep, which is relaxation and calming. <laughs> so even though the thing itself is potentially beneficial, the negative side effects that come along with it completely wash out any benefit and actually dig you farther in the hole. I think that's, that's such a counterintuitive, but important misconception. And I'm glad you brought up sleep hygiene because actually my first one is related to sleep. I'm like you, I'm, I'm sort of, Sleep hygiene is fine, like whatever. <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of it for the reasons you just talked about. What I tend to talk with my clients, especially these kind of high achieving striver types is instead of thinking about this the huge laundry list of sleep hygiene shoulds and should nots, I think about, I like to think about this phrase called the sleep runway. And the sleep runway comes from this analogy or metaphor of you're a high achiever. You, in a lot of ways, you are like a huge like jumbo jet. And what I mean by that is you're very high performing. Jumbo jets are incredible. Like when you're at the, when you're at the airport, watching a huge 747, like take off is just mind blowing that we can do that. Like that's so incredible that a thing that big can not only get off the ground, but then for hours and hours and hours travels at 300 miles an hour at 30,000 feet. Like that's just incredible. It takes hundreds of people, thousands of miles all across the globe. It's incredible. And so I think that's a lot of these striver, people who are strivers, right, are like this. They're very high performing, but like stick with the metaphor. <laughs> One thing you'll notice if you've ever been on a, a jumbo jet, a 747, here's what they don't do. They don't cruise at 30,000 feet, 300 miles an hour until they are directly above the airport and then nosedive and go right down to the, no, that's a disaster. That's going to end in a fireball. <laughs> All jets, the way they land is about 45 minutes or half an hour before they get to the airport they start a slow, gradual descent where they go from 300 miles an hour at 30,000 feet to 200 miles an hour at 20,000 feet, whatever. And they slowly decrease, they hit the runway. And then even on the runway, when they're really close to the airport, they put on the brakes and they slow down even more. And then they come to a nice, gentle stop <laughs> at the gate. So I think what a lot of strivers end up doing is the like, cruise super fast until they're right above the airport and then think they can just get right into bed and fall asleep. And it just, your sleep system doesn't work that way. You need to descend slowly. So you need a sleep runway and a sleep runway is just, it's a period of time before you get into bed where you are, you are not striving. You're not engaging in effortful activity. I think about the little acronym. You want to ease your way into sleep and ease is like, you want to avoid activities that are effortful. What's the other ones? Analytical, striving, and exciting, right? Effortful, analytical, striving, and exciting. Things like that tend to rev you up, which is the opposite of what you need in order to go to sleep. So I think what all sort of strivers in particular should do is really think about building. And then the key thing is protecting your sleep runway. This period of like an hour, hour and a half before sleep, where it's just very calming 
you don't have to be like meditating in a sensory deprivation chamber necessarily. You could be like sitting on the couch watching a, a sitcom, you know, or reading a book or, but you want to avoid effortful activities. And what, what I found is for these high achieving types, the two like main culprits that tend to disrupt the sleep runway are worky stuff like emails and work. Oh, I just got to do this one more thing for work. I respond to this one email, whatever, or serious conversations. Now, both of these, they're, they're hot. We fall into them easily because they seem like good things to do doing work, right? It's a good thing to do, solve problems at work or have serious conversations with our spouse or a friend or something like that. These seem like really good things to do, but they are both incredibly effortful and they lead to a lot of arousal. We get around, you know, we're highly aroused. And so, so then, you know, 1130 rolls around or whatever our bedtime is. And it's like, huh, like, why am I not tired? Why am I laying in bed here? Like thinking about a million things. Well, it's because you didn't protect your sleep runway. <laughs> you allowed all this effortful analytical activity to come in. And so you're understandably aroused for a while and it's going to take a while to kind of calm down. So I think what you want to do is you want to think of this time before bed as your sleep runway. You need time to descend slowly and you need the most important thing is you have to protect that. It's easy to say once, oh yeah, sleep runway. Great. I'm gonna go do that. And you do it for a couple of days and it's fine. And then, you know, then on the third night, you get an email from your boss. You know, oh, you know, I should really respond to this. Or you and your spouse get into a disagreement. You think, no, we need to settle this now. And you get into an hour and a half long conversation that, you know, you're both upset and angry and now you can't sleep. So really trying to think about setting good, good boundaries around this sleep runway period before sleep and sticking to them. That's the hard part. But protecting that sleep runway, super important. So that's my, that's my first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was, you know, as you're talking, I was like, it's something that really fascinating, you know, came to my mind, at least in my opinion, which is that you use this kind of landing of an airplane for as an analogy. And I used it in, too, in a little different way, but I want to share that with the, with the audience because I think that can be really helpful. But before that, I want to say that it's, I think it's very true that, you know, the day has a certain like energy and the night has another type of energy, if you will. Mm -hmm. for, for, for most of us, the day is a time for, we're striving in a way. It's like for, get, for working, for getting stuff done, you know, for doing, for, for being kind of in, for, for doing mode, if you will, where the night has a different energy. The night is for like, you know, non-striving. The night is for, for, for not, engage, not, not non-goal oriented activities. It's kind of like, it, it has a different energy. And if somebody attempts to transition from kind of like, now I'm in kind of day mode, doing mode, and just jump into bed and expect to sleep right away, they're probably not, that's, that's probably not going to happen. And so the way kind of we teach this is, you know, to, to have, a, we, we call it like a timeless sleep window where we just like say, okay, at, you know, 10 PM or something like that, this is where my day ends and my night starts, if you will. So mm -hmm. we, we, we just kind of say, you can just take your, take your time off the clock. You don't know what time it is. And you just do something that is nice for you like that that's non-goal oriented and that's that's very very similar to what you said and i think that can be really really helpful now actually one more thing i want to add to that is like the high achiever who hears us talk about this right for example the the sleep runway here will be thinking like okay how do i do that nick how exactly <laughs> what book should i read what should i avoid and and, and so th that's the tricky thing about this is that even kind of an invitation for non-doing can to the high achiever become like, oh, I have to perfect the sleep runway and do it exactly in a prescribed manner so I achieve sleep, mm. which is tricky. And so if, if anybody hears that in the audience, I think, you know, how to meet that is really just awareness. Like when, when you have the self-awareness and you realize that, oh, I've gotten into the habit of turning everything, even a nice, helpful advice from Nick into kind of like an attempt to force sleep to happen, then that automatically often leads to like these efforts kind of fade away by themselves. Like to me, it's sort of like a, like the tricky thing with these efforts that we talked about is like when they happen in the dark, when they're sort of secret, we don't realize they're happening. Mm -hmm. But once they're revealed, once we see our own thought patterns, then the thought pattern automatically shifts and we kind of automatically go into to a more, you know, gentle way where we're not trying to force sleep. And I know I talked a lot already, but I want to add one more thing. And I have to talk about the, the airplane thing. So yeah. You know, one thing uh, that happens to, I'm sure, a lot of high achievers who have trouble sleeping and others who have insomnia is that 
the tr the transition from sleep uh, or from wakefulness into sleep is interrupted by these like jerks, you know, hypnic jerks. Like they're just about to fall asleep and then they have a jerk. And that, that makes the person like upset and, and angry and, and oh, you, aroused, you mean when right? they're in bed, like a hypnic yeah, jerk. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yes, exactly. In bed, they're kind of feeling sleepy. They're just about yep. to drift off, but then they have this jerk. And then this person get, gets is upset naturally because they're like, I was just to fall asleep. And now why does this happen? And then... It, and then, you know, they feel sleepy again. And, but then they're kind of like on the lookout for this jerk, a little bit hyper aroused, mm. right? And then it happens again. It can be quite, quite, quite bothersome for a lot of people. And that's where I, I use this analogy of like, imagine that being awake is like being an airplane, right? Mm -hmm. You're kind of flying and asleep is kind of when the airplane has landed. And imagine if the the, the airplane, let's say, let's, let's merge this with your analogy. Let's say it's a jumbo jet. The jumbo jet is flying, right? And it's going down for landing, but at that stage when we're transitioning, there's often some turbulence, you know, you can feel like mm. some shaking in the, in, in the aircraft, you know, things can kind of are a bit bumpy. And if the pilot then goes like, oh no, this is turbulent, turbulence, we, we can't land like this. We have to go up again. They're not going to land. But on the other hand, if, if, if the pilot recognizes that this is just normal turbulence, it's fine. It's normal. Nothing strange with this. Then landing will occur. And it's the same thing with these hypnic jerks. If anybody in the audience has been bothered by them they happen actually to everyone they're they're a very normal part of the transitioning from wake to sleep which we often don't even notice so when when it happens to someone and they go like oh this is just normal turbulence nothing to to react to really then sleep happens so so i'll so i'll pause there back to you nick no i i love that and i think it's like hypnic jerk would be one example but it could just be a like a, a worry pops into your mind and it kind of like you get lit up a little bit and so it, it applies to a whole class of things that you're, you're doing a pretty good job maintaining your sleep runway winding down but then these intrusive things happen, whether it's a, whatever it is. But I love your approach of normalizing and validating it. Like it's okay. That doesn't throw off the whole thing, which is, I think for us kind of perfectionists, we get a little black and white about, I have to be doing it perfectly. Like you were saying, and if it's not perfect, like I'm screwed and like it's over, you know? but no, like it's okay. You can have little imperfections. Like your body can handle that. It's normal. Just like a plane can handle a little bit of turbulence. It feels scary, but it's fine. It'll be fine. So I, I love that mindset of kind of validating and rolling with little intrusions or difficulties or bumps along the way. I think that, yeah, I think that's, that's super important. So while, while we're talking about bedtime, I have another one. I'd be curious to get, I feel pretty strongly about this, but it's a little bit counter to what you typically hear in terms of advice about sleep and, and bedtime. My mantra or my advice often with sleep is, and bedtimes is you should have a consistent wake up time and a flexible bedtime. You often hear the reverse. What people say is like, I go to bed at 10.53 every single night. And then I, I, and I say like, well, when do you wake up? Well, I don't know, like 5.30, 6.30, 7 sometimes, 5.15. In my opinion, this is completely backwards <laughs> because, because I think the co core issue here is control. You, you can control when you get up. You can decide. You can set your alarm and you can decide, I'm actually going to get up at 6.30 every morning, right? You can't control when you get sleepy. <laughs> you can control when you get into bed, but as I'm sure anyone listening to this knows, if you get into bed when you're not sleepy, you are setting yourself up for just a rough time generally because <laughs> you're going to lay in there. You're not going to be sleepy. You're going to start thinking. You're start worrying about why you're not sleeping. Then you're revving yourself up even more and lowering your odds of being able to fall asleep quickly anyway. So what I tell people is you actually, th this idea that you should get into bed at the exact same time every single night is terrible. It's not just not good advice. It's actively bad advice, I think, <laughs> because you should, and it gets at this important distinction, really important distinction, which is kind of subtle, but tired is not the same thing as sleepy. A lot of people, especially high achievers make this mistake of, oh my God, I'm exhausted. It's been such a long day. I have to get into bed and they're tired. They're physically exhausted, but that is not the same thing as sleepy. Right? The metaphor I like for this is, suppose you're running a marathon and you cross the finish line of a marathon. There are going to be a lot of very tired people crossing the finish line of a marathon. It, as far as I know, nobody falls asleep after running a marathon. <laughs> so just, be, just because tired and sleepy sometimes overlap doesn't mean they always do. And very often in the evenings, you may be incredibly tired, but if you're not sleepy, it's not a great idea to get in bed because sleepiness is your body's sign that you're actually ready for sleep. And you get that, you get like the heavy eyelids or you start kind of nodding off while you're watching TV or reading a book or something like that. So generally speaking, especially for people who are really struggling um, with their sleep, I tend to pe tell people don't, no matter what time it is, if you're still revved up, don't get into bed just because you're tired. 
Because then you're going to start associating your bed. Your brain is going to start associating your bed with being wired and with thinking a lot and problem solving because you're not actually ready to sleep. Wait until you're actually getting sleepy and then get in. So be flexible in your bedtime, but be consistent in your wake-up time. And we can talk more about the consistent wake-up time more. But I think when it comes to bedtimes, that being flexible and having, like, I think you kind of alluded to it, maybe have like a window of generally speaking, I, you know, my, my kind of loose goal is I would like to be in bed between, you know, 10 and 11 or something like that. I think that's about as far as you want to go at, in on the kind of side of scheduling or planning for sleep. And so you just want to be sort of open to whenever you get sleepy. So I don't know, what do you, what do you think about, what do you think about that? Am I, am I off base there or? Well, I, I, I agree with uh, a lot of things you said and, and, you know, I think there are some great points that we can discuss on, on some topics here, but firstly, hundred percent agree with like the, the, the typical mainstream advice you hear is like, okay, if you have trouble sleeping, you got to go to bed at the same time. And you, you oftentimes you also hear you got to get up at the same time too. But mm -hmm. I a hundred percent agree with you. Somebody goes, thinks that, oh, I have to be in bed exactly at 10 30 PM every night so I can sleep, you know, my eight hours very, very tricky because it, it, it factors in nothing in terms of how this person feels at that moment in time. Now, on the wake-up side, I also agree that there it can really help to have some structure there, you know, to, to, to you know, start your day at about the same time every day. Now, the reason for this, you know, I think is a bit different from the mainstream idea. The mainstream idea is that, well, if you get up the same time every morning, you kind of regularize your circadian rhythm and you you build sleep drive from the same time every day, mm -hmm. every morning. And I think there's some truth to that. But the main reason I think is helpful to actually, you know, have some consistency in terms of the morning end it has more to do with what you and I discussed at some other point briefly, which is that trouble sleeping is so much about like chasing sleep. It's kind of like sleep has become this thing that you have to achieve. You you have to get, you have to strive to, to have some of it, right? And, and again, the more you try, the less you sleep. And what happens a lot is that somebody has some trouble sleeping. They wake up early. They say, I, I woke up too early. So I have to make up for that by staying in bed an extra hour mm. or two to try to get some more sleep. And the problem to me is not so much that this disrupts their circadian rhythm, uh, but rather that they're engaging in this like chasing sleep behavior. They're, they're lying in bed, like trying to get some more sleep, which reinforces the idea that they should chase sleep, which you know keeps their insomnia going, right? So when on the other hand, somebody said like, no matter what the night was like, no matter what the night was like, I'm, I have an alarm set at this time, that's when I start my day, that can really help because then this person may wake up early and be kind of frustrated, but then their alarm goes off and they're like, okay, time to start my day. And then they they move away from this like chasing sleep behavior. And when they're no longer chasing sleep, it happens much easier. So I think that is uh, really, really helpful. Now, one- I like, I, just, just to yeah, pile yeah, sure. on there, I I really agree. I mean, I think, like you said, there is something to the regularizing your, your kind of sleep cycle and circadian rhythms and having enough time to build up sleep drive, all that. I think there is something to that. But I agree with you. I think the more important part about being consistent with your wake-up time is- it's the, like the name of your book, the set it and forget it idea. What you want, generally speaking, if you struggle with insomnia, especially if you're a high achiever, I, you know, I would bet the farm on you think way too much about sleep. People with insomnia think way more about sleep than people who don't have insomnia. And well, you might say, well, of course we do. We have insomnia. We have a problem. We want to think, well, that's true, but the causality goes both ways. <laughs> the more you think about it, the more aroused you get in the harder time you have sleeping. So I, I like, I think the consistent wake up time, it's the bigger factor, like you're pointing out is this idea is you want to stop strategizing and thinking about and tinkering with and trying to manipulate your sleep. You just have a rule and you follow it and you don't think about it, regardless of the details of how you happen to sleep that night or, or not, you just kind of set it and forget it. So I, I just want, I wanted to call it your book if, if nothing else, but I, I love that point. I think it's a really subtle, but a really important point that that's the big reason to be relatively consistent with your wake up time. So just exclamation point on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, this could be fun for your audience to know that this, yeah, set it and forget it is the book that's sitting behind me for those of you who are, who are you know, seeing this as a video. And I actually named that book, set it and forget it 
uh, from you know from what, what you said you you actually said like set and forget it in one of our <laughs> i think it was our first podcast i loved it it's like i'm gonna call my book set and forget it so you're you know that's mentioned in the forward so you know i thought that could be just for the audience to know yeah <laughs> sorry i cut you off there Danny. you you were you were you were still rolling with your with this oh, yeah, idea yeah, yeah. of consistent wake up times yeah 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 yeah. There, there was one more thing i want to add to this which is you know it's this whole the, the whole topic insomnia sleep struggles it's so paradoxical and here's another paradox generally speaking when we think like you know i'll i'm just going to go to bed when i feel sleepy it, it makes so much sense because as you pointed out sleepiness is when our body's kind of signaling to us that this is our time to sleep now the tricky part here again for the high achiever is that a lot of people go okay i get it i'm going to wait until i have the sleepiness cue before i go to bed and so they spend their evening kind of waiting for that mm -hmm. sleepiness cue and in the moment they're like I felt sleepy. Well, this is it. This is the time. This is the time. But, or, or wait, was it? Was I sleepy enough? My one eyelid felt heavy. The other one didn't feel heavy. And the, the tricky thing, of course, is here is that monitoring for sleepiness can make us hyper aroused. So the sleepiness goes away. And, and so it's, it's another one of these paradoxes. And, and for, for anyone who's experienced that, I would say that in that case, I think what helps is going more fuzzy, making things kind of a little bit more fuzzy, which is sort of like, instead of waiting for like, the perfect sleepiness cue, then go to bed when you feel like it, when it feels like, you know, my day is over. I want to go to bed and, and you can do something nice for yourself, like in bed, not like if you go to bed, waiting for sleep to happen, that is very tricky. Just like you said, Nick, if someone goes to bed, like now I'm going to sleep, I'm going to wait for sleep to happen. That, 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 that the waiting itself makes it take a long time for sleep to happen. It just becomes kind of a prolonged, you know, you know uh, difficult experience. But if you go to bed and you're like, okay, my day's over, this is my night, and I'm gonna read something nice in my bed. I'm not, I'm not waiting for sleep. I'm just kind of doing something nice, and then, and then things kind of happen by themselves, if you will. So, so I think that's the way to meet that tricky situation. If sleepiness disappears because you're monitoring for it. I, I love that point. Again, that's it's funny. It's I guess it is a subtle point. It seems like kind of a small but subtle point, but I think it's actually huge. Like I saw this over and over again. Like this is the kind of monitoring for sleep. So I, yeah, I agree with you. I think I found that a lot of that though goes away if you are um, smart about kind of designing and, and protecting your sleep runway. If you have a, a simple, consistent set of activities or routines in the evening that are relaxation promoting. So if, if your routine is just that, you know, every evening at, you know, I put the kids to bed at eight and then my wife and I, you know, we, we watch a show for an hour or an hour and a half and then we get to bed, right? If you're just, if you're watching sitcoms, <laughs> like you're, that's going to be very like relaxation promoting. If you're just sitting there or you're just reading some nice, like a, a good fiction book or something like that, those activities are going to, they're, they're going to drift you into sleepiness and you're going to find yourself getting drowsy getting sleepy. So I think some, and they also often kind of, they, because they take on your attention, they prevent a lot of that sleep monitoring too. So if you're the kind of person who is struggling with this, the kind of, you know, being too self-aware about your sleep, I'm like, am I tired yet? Am I sleepy? Is this the left eye, but the right, the right eye? <laughs> I think finding some activities that incentivize sort of relaxation can be, can be a nice sort of bridging behavior to this new way of thinking about sleep. So finding activities that kind of help you think and act in a, in a sleep promoting way, rather than just like sitting there twiddling your thumbs, like waiting for yourself to fall asleep. That's obviously not going to be, you know. so, but you brought up something that's something kind of interesting. This idea of getting into bed. Normally I would say, if you're not sleepy, don't get into bed because what I don't want you to do is all the way back to like uh, Pavlov, Pavlov's dog. I don't want you getting in bed and then doing things in bed that are arousing so that you associate arousing activities with your bed. So the next time you get in bed, your mind is immediately like, Ooh, start problem solving, thinking about this terrible thing that's going to happen in the future, all this kind of stuff that you really don't want that. But it sounds like you suggested that it's okay to get into bed, even if you're not totally sleepy, as long as finish the sentence for me, as long as what? Yeah. I would say as long as you're not going to bed, intending to like make that you know have that make you fall asleep or something if you I'll, I'll you know you shared a little bit about kind of your bedtime routine i'll share mm -hmm. a little bit of ours so you know very similarly you know putting the get 
kids to sleep, like, you know, reading them a book, but brushing teeth, et cetera. But what me and my wife actually like to do is get into bed and watch some Netflix show together, you know? Oh, and yes. I love it. Okay. A sleep <laughs> expert is telling people <laughs> that he watches TV in bed. I love this so much. Sorry. I just had to say that. Okay. Go, keep going. I love it. I'm so yeah, excited. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I remember you actually had told the client that at one point and you were like, oh, I, I broke the rules and I was, I was kind of excited about it. But then, anyway, uh, we, we do that. And I think it's actually not that uncommon. I think a lot of people do this. Yeah. And at that moment, when I go to bed, I'm not feeling sleepy at all. I just know mm -hmm. that my day's over. I just want to take it. I would just want to relax and, and chill out here. And then what invariably always happens is my wife starts like dozing off. And then I know that's, that's kind of my cue. Like my wife is falling asleep. You know, and at that point, I don't, I don't necessarily feel that sleepy either, but I know like the, the day's over, I'm just going to lay here and relax now and just kind of like, you know, think about something pleasant and then I fall asleep. So, mm -hmm. so that's, so again, if somebody goes to bed before they're sleepy, you know, again, a sort of an effort, like oh, I'm going to go early so I can, like, I'm going to go to bed early now so I can maximize my chance of sleep, tricky. But if you go to bed and you're not necessarily super sleepy, but you're like, I just want to lay in my bed and, and chillax and do something soothing and nice there. Um, I think it's totally fine. I love that. I, so to me, the, the overall principle is what, like, what is my brain associating with my bed? I think that's the really key question to ask yourself. So if you're in bed and you are, you know, just watching a, watching a TV show, you know, old reruns of Seinfeld or great British baking show or something, you know, kind of relaxing and nice, your brain is probably associating the bed with relaxation which is good because then anytime you get to bed in the future, it like Pavlov's dog, dog who just starts drooling at the sound of a bell, your brain is going to go right into relaxation mode because that's what you've, it's associated with bed. But if you get into bed and then you just lay there and you start worrying about, you start going through your to-do list for tomorrow and you start worrying about what if I don't sleep? How am I going to feel tomorrow if I only get seven hours of sleep instead of eight hours? <laughs> now you're getting anxious and you're associating worry and arousal with bed so that Tomorrow, when you get, even if you're sleepy and you get into bed, you're going to get anxious because you've trained your brain to associate it with worrying and thinking and arousal and all that kind of thing. So I, I love that the, the advice of like, don't watch TV in bed or don't get into bed unless you're completely sleepy. It's actually sort of missing the point. The, the better underlying principle is like being in bed and being kind of relaxed or calm as opposed to being effortful, striving, worrying, that sort of thing. That's actually the more underlying principle. Yeah. And, you know, I, I've had so many clients, students over the years who said like my, my bed was a battlefield, you know, it turned into a battlefield and every mm -hmm. night I was like preparing to go to battle there. And that, that shows your point that the bed can be associated with like real intense struggle, which is not helpful at all. And, and, you know, when that changes, like everything changes and, you know, speaking of kind of like counterintuitive advice, a lot of people in the, in, in the audience probably have heard about stimulus control that's, you know, taught in, 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 in the context of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or CBTI. And, you know, in one way, if the, if you have a real struggle in bed and you just want to kind of leave that for a while and give yourself a break, I think it, it can be really nice, but it can also oh, wait, be hold on now. So, so for people who aren't familiar with this, stimulus control is basically the idea that if you're overstimulated in bed, you're worrying, you're anxious, whatever, get out of bed and do something until you're relaxed and sleepy again, and then get back into bed for that same reason. You don't want to associate arousal with your bed. Right. And so yeah, we, yeah. sorry, keep, keep going. I just 100%. Want to no, that's that good. Folks. Cause a lot of people probably never heard of that before. And, and you know, the, the tricky situation can be when somebody again is like, you know, associating the bed with like a real battle and struggle. Right. So they, they're really they're kind of afraid of their own bed. Mm. So I, what I've done is, is kind of a, variation of that or like reverse stimulus control. I don't know what you want to call it, but what I've heard, what have helped a lot of people in our community is actually to spend some time in bed during the day, just doing something nice with the intent of kind of like changing that association. So that I've heard a lot of people be like, I was so afraid of my bed that what I did was like during the day, I went 30 minutes into, I purposely sat in my bed for 30 minutes, just like, you know, browsing the internet or something relaxing. And that was really helpful to me. So I just want to share that one. Interesting. I, I, wait, what did you call it? You had a good marketable term there, like reverse stimulus control. Yeah, I called it reverse <laughs> stimulus control. I like that. You know, it makes me think of I, I, a lot of, not a lot, but some of my more severe insomnia cases, people would get to the point where they would say, I'm going to go, I'm going to go sleep in another bedroom because I, and in short term, you know, what's interesting about this is 
Short term, it's not a terrible strategy because yes, you might not have as many negative associations with you know your guest bedroom bed. And maybe briefly, what it does is it, for a couple nights, it helps you fall asleep better. The problem is, I think what you're you're sort of villainizing your bed. <laughs> you're turning it into the enemy. And it's this, it turns into this thing where like, yeah, it's like a battlefield. Like you have to conquer your sleep problems and your bed that's making you, you know, giving you insomnia and all this kind of stuff. So long-term, I, I almost never go along with a recommend a strategy like that because I think it perpetuates this combative mindset that people develop with sleep where I have to like strive to like vanquish the enemy of insomnia. And, and that just <laughs> as well-intentioned as it is, as we've talked about, totally counterproductive. So, I, and then I, I think too, this is a trend I've noticed among kind of like a newer generation of, of therapists and psychologists and, and kind of sleep professionals is that it's not that stimulus control is wrong necessarily, but it, the side effects can outweigh the benefits for a lot of the reasons you talked about. And so I'm curious what you think, like one of the things I will recommend is instead of getting out of bed, like if you, and this is a common thing, and this is actually one of my points, what do you do if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're worrying about something? right? That's like a common dilemma. Like, what do you do in that situation? M my recommendation is normally try to do something that promotes relaxation. Not again, like don't try to sleep. That's, that's ridiculous. If you're like worried and anxious and worrying about something, it's silly to think you're just gonna be able to fight, fall asleep like that. It's not going to happen because you're not going to do it. Then you get frustrated that you're anxious about sleeping and it's just gonna be worse and worse and worse. Instead, do something in bed, I think that promotes and incentivizes relaxation. So like listening to an audiobook or a podcast or something, something that's really like music. I've had a few people who, who like music, like putting on some music and just listening to music, something like that, but doing something that, that encourages your brain to get into a non striving kind of arousal inducing mode, and then just allowing relaxation to come knowing, trusting that if you can relax in bed, you will probably then fall asleep. Um, so anyway, that's, that's usually my take on what do you, if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're worried in bed and your thoughts are like racing, but what do you think? Like, what do you, when, when people pose that question to you, like, what's your, what's your kind of standard advice on that situation? Yeah. I actually get that question so often that I have a kind of my go-to one, two, three, you know, you, card, answer, you like, just hand people like, so here, read this <laughs> QR code, scan this. No, <laughs> I, I, I say, you know, I, I'm going to get very, you know, t t you know, comment on your point, you know, with my, my thoughts, which are very similar to yours, but my, my kind of one, two, three, three step advice, if you will, for anyone who asks me this question is firstly, you know, don't check the time, you know, because what most people do is like they wake up at night and they're worried and like, what time is it? How much have I slept? How much mm -hmm. do I have to And that, you know, our good friend, Martin Reed, for those of you who don't know him, he's a, he's an insomnia coach. Uh, he's, he once said, have you ever woken up in the middle of the night, checked the time and felt like, oh, how nice it's that time, a wave of relief. And then you just felt <laughs> Nobody ever says that. It's always like, no matter what time it is, it's like, oh no, I didn't sleep enough. Oh, I don't have enough. So not checking the time is kind of my number one. Just don't know, don't don't check the time. Don't know what what time it is. That's kind of really helpful. Number two, I call it like accepting reality, which is like you're awake now. At this moment, you are awake. You know, and 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 what do I mean by accepting reality? Well, a lot of people go like, this is unacceptable. I can't be awake now. I have to immediately mm -hmm. make myself fall asleep as soon as possible. How can I do that? Which again becomes this effort that keeps us awake, right? So first, don't check the time, except reality, you're awake now. And that kind of gives you choices. Okay, I'm awake now. What do I do now? And the third one leads to what we call befriending wakefulness. So the way we see insomnia is really kind of an ongoing struggle that is rooted in a fear of not sleeping or a fear of being awake, if you will. So being awake is something we think of as like the enemy, the, the, the foe, like the antagonist, something like that. And so what we want to do is teach our brain that being awake is maybe not what we want to be at any given moment, but it's not something dangerous. It's not a threat. It's not something we're harmless. It's just a harmless mind state. So befriending wakefulness is basically doing anything that teaches our brain that it's okay to be awake. And those examples you mentioned, like reading a book, you know, listening to some music uh, while awake, even in our bed can really teach ourselves not only that it's, you know, the bed is harmless, it's totally safe. There's nothing we need to villainize there, but also being awake is, is harmless and safe and, and not a threat. And, and when that happens, when, when the brain realizes it's not dangerous to be awake, it's not dangerous to be in bed, then sleep just happens. Yeah. I really like that. 
And we, I want to, want to plug another one of our, our friends, Dr. Jade Wu, who's another sleep expert and who's a, a buddy of ours. And she has a book. I, I love her book's great, but I, I love, I love the title of the book. Her book is called Hello Sleep, which I just, it, it's such a wonderful title because it, it immediately suggests this attitude, this relationship with sleep, this kind of friendly, like, oh, like, hello, <laughs> right? It is sleep or lack of sleep is this thing you're in a relationship with. And it might be irritating or annoying sometimes. It might be like a godsend sometimes, but regardless, you, you want, it's a relationship. You want to cultivate a healthy relationship. It's not a, it's not a thing to get rid of or a thing that's good or bad necessarily. And so I like getting kind of like relational with your sleep or lack of sleep, I think is really, really, yeah, just so helpful. And her, anyway, her, her, her book is awesome on, on that point, but, but I like this framework too. Let me see if I remember it's a, don't check the time, accept reality. And then sort of, how did you phrase, how did you phrase the, the third Befriend one? Befriend wakefulness. Befriend wakefulness. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Two out of three. It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, but let's, let's address some of these up because I, I'm sure there are people hearing this and they're like, yeah, yeah, that's all fine. And good for you guys to say, like it, not sleeping, being up in the middle of the night, it's not, not a big deal. It's not dangerous, whatever, but it's like, but I'm, you know, I'm the CEO of some big company and you know, I've got a big share, you know, a big meeting with the board and I got to be on my game tomorrow. So yeah, it is kind of a problem if I'm awake for two hours in the middle of the night. How do you like, uh, okay, <laughs> that's, that's not, that's not crazy. That's a reasonable re response there. So like, how, how do you respond when people come back with something like, sort of like that? Like, what's your, what's your approach to that? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a very common question. And there are two things that immediately come to mind, you know, with this example of the CEO, we had, it was a big meeting, et cetera. And one of them is actually a reference to a study. This is a, you know, I don't know the name of the study or where it was published actually, but anyone can just go to Google and, and, and search like Canadian surgeons performance and, and, they'll, and they'll find it. So a couple of years ago, th there was a big study done in Canada where they looked at surgical outcome, depending on if the surgeon was sleep deprived or not. So they looked at like call schedules and they could tell if a surgeon had been like on call and, and up all night or mm -hmm. if they were just at home sleeping before a, a particular surgery. And these were kind of like, not just like removing a mole. This was kind of like, you know, you know, invasive, like big surgeries. Yeah. And, and when they looked at the data, they found that the difference in terms of like complications and rehospitalizations, mortality, morbidity uh, among the sleep deprived surgeons and non-sleep deprived surgeons was nothing. There was no difference wow. whatsoever, right? Which was, which I, a lot of times just saying that to people makes them like, feel so, such relief, like, oh, that's nice to hear. The point being that anyone who's not slept a whole night knows that we can feel a bit tired and foggy and not really like ourselves. But when it comes to like critical decision-making, things that are really, really important, we have this ability to kind of rally resources and make the right decisions and even, even function at a, an extremely high level when it comes to like dexterity and things of that nature. So that kind of is the first first place I'd go to kind of sh share this, this knowledge and information. But then I would also like to share this, this kind of thought experiment that I, that I share all the time with clients. And it goes as follows. Imagine you take a random person, somebody just off the street, and you keep this person up like the whole night. And then you ask this person, how do you feel right now? What we're likely to hear is that this person will say, you know what, I feel a bit sleepy, I feel tired, a little foggy, like it's, it's a little hard for me to concentrate right now, which just proves that yes, of course, if we're not sleeping, that has an impact on us, regardless of how we think about it. But what really matters is what we don't hear. We take this person again, keep them up a whole night, and then we ask them, how do you feel right now? What will we not hear from this random person we kept up all night? What, will, what we will not hear from this person is, my world is ending. I feel a tsunami of anxiety. I can't function. I can't put my sh one shoe in front of the other. I just feel completely out of sorts. I'm like nauseous, you know? And this shows us that what really, really matters in terms of how we feel the following day after a little sleep is not so much that we slept little, but rather the storyline around it, how we interpret it, you know? And when that shifts, the interpretation or storyline then, then everything shifts and, and the fear of sleeping little, like really starts to fade away. So that's, that's how I'd reply. I love it. That, that's one of mine is like, don't catastrophize poor sleep. 
Because you see what, what people end up doing, and this is it's very normal, it's a human thing to do to get into this sort of black and white or all or nothing thinking, especially when we're under duress, when we're stressed out, we easily go into like good guy, bad guy, <laughs> black, white thinking. And the way that shows up with sleep, as, as you're sort of pointing out, is like, I, I got my like perfect deep eight hours and that's what I need. But if I didn't get that, if I'm, you know, I woke up in the middle of the night and I'm going to be awake for at least a couple hours, I'm only going to get six hours of sleep. Like everything's going to be awful. <laughs> in In reality it's extremely rare that anyone gets perfectly optimal sleep every single night. People who are good sleepers don't sleep perfectly optimally every single night. It's totally normal to have just pretty good sleep, not like perfectly optimal sleep. And then also it's extremely rare, even with people with insomnia, to have terrible, earth-shattering, catastrophically bad sleep. That just doesn't happen. In fact, like, yeah, and you could probably speak to this more, more than I can as a physician, but like your brain basically won't let you sleep less than about three or four hours a night. Like if you're laying in bed, you, you, <laughs> your brain will make you get the minimum required amount of sleep. And once you get four or five hours of sleep, you may not feel amazing, but like you said, you are going to perform fine. <laughs> Is it going to be, are you going to be in the 99.9 percentile? Like, I don't, maybe not, right? <laughs> but, and then here's the, the second part I think that's really important is, Okay, let's say that's true. Like, yes, it's a disaster that you are up for an hour and a half in the middle of the night. What's the alternative? Is thinking more about how much of a disaster it is that you're up in the middle of the night for two hours, is that going to help things? No, it, that is definitely going to make things worse. It's only going to make it harder to fall back to sleep. So even if it is a catastrophe that you're up in the middle of the night, thinking about it as a catastrophe is still going to be a net negative. <laughs> so don't do it. <laughs> and instead of laying there in bed, thinking about your sleep and trying harder to sleep, go back to Daniel's three steps, right? And befriend the wakefulness. Embrace that like, okay, it's not optimal, but it's probably not terrible either. And what you, you brought up the study and like one of my favorite studies about sleep ever, I just love this study. And so it just really resonates with my experience too. But the study compared... What it looked at, there's all this research that is based on people's self-report about sleep. All these like guidelines about how much sleep you should get. It's, it's really ridiculous when you look at how they come up with these numbers. They just take a bunch of people and they say like, how often do you sleep? And someone's like, hmm, I don't know, like maybe eight hours. And that's what these guidelines are based on. It's bonkers. People are terrible at self-report. And so what, what this study looked at is like, how accurate are people's level of self-report? about their sleep. And so they, they got groups of people and they put like physiological measures of, so they, they measured empirically, like actually how much time are you spending sleeping? And the two the really two interesting findings was they compared people who were healthy sleepers, no insomnia, no sleep trouble with people who had, who were like in, who, who had insomnia, clinical grade insomnia. What they found is a, there wasn't actually that much difference in the amount of hours they slept, but even more surprising was People who are healthy sleepers overestimated how much sleep they got by over an hour. Over an hour. That's wild. And so everyone's saying, I get eight hours of sleep every night. And really, it's much closer to seven. And then, really interestingly, people with insomnia underestimate how much they sleep by between an hour and an hour and a half per night. That is cool. Like, that is so wild. It's not surprising because we, like, we all have... It's a, it's, a, it's a hard thing to actually gauge empirically. So I, I don't want to be like critical of these, but it's important to know if you struggle with sleep, A, you're probably sleeping more than you think, maybe by a significant degree, right? And also all those other people who are talking about how they get eight, eight hours of sleep. They're full of it. <laughs> they're not getting eight hours every single night. <laughs> they're maybe getting seven and they're, that's totally fine and healthy. So I think keeping realistic gray, non-black and white thinking about sleep letting things be a little fuzzy, like you, as, as you kind of pointed out, Daniel, which admittedly is very hard for those of us who are high achievers, strivers, a little perfectionistic. That's hard to do, but that is under the hood. That's like the most important kind of mindset thing. I think that's going to help with sleep is embracing a slightly fuzzier, more relaxed <laughs> attitude and approach to sleep. So Anyway, I, I hijacked your your points there, but I think you brought up the study and it's, there's, it's just so interesting. It's so important, I think, for people to know. No, 100%. And I want to, you know, continue from where you left off here on the study and and just highlight that 100%. I've made the same, like, 
reflection that <laughs> recommendations come from self-report, which is exactly said. That doesn't make any sense. It's kind of like asking people, how much do you think you sleep? And saying, oh, people think they sleep this much. So therefore, we should recommend it to everyone. It doesn't make any, any sense. And what you brought up with this particular study you mentioned is actually validated with many, many studies. There's multiple studies that show the exact same thing. Then when you, when you take a group of like, say, a thousand people, and you ask like, do you have trouble sleeping? And some people report having insomnia and then they separate them into let's say a, a significant number. Often it's like 20% say they have insomnia. And so we say like 20% said they have insomnia, 80% said they didn't have insomnia. Look at how much they sleep. And it's it's the same. It's just like, there's no difference, right? Which in itself is so so help, so help so, so interesting. And exactly as you said, very reproducibly, we find that people who have no struggle sleep overestimate by about an hour People who have insomnia underestimated by now are very, very, very reproducible results. But here's the thing that, that I want to kind of add on to what you said. I, I have no doubt that a lot of my students and clients who are in a really difficult place, they actually sleep very little. Like they have nights where they sleep like just sure. an hour, an hour or, or almost like that, that does happen. Right. And so I, so, so I want, you know, people to know that, you know, we're not poo-pooing that, but the, the, where, where my mind went from there is like, so why then doesn't that show up in the data? Why is it that the data still shows no difference between the non insomnia group and the insomnia group? Mm -hmm. Well, I pondered this a lot. And to me, the only explanation becomes that within the non insomnia group, that also happens. That must also happen. So it, it, not only do people who have no trouble sleeping overestimate how much mm -hmm. they sleep, but I also think they have nights where they sleep very little for some reason. And you know, don't think that much about it. So I, that's where kind of my moment. moment. I think, yeah, very interesting. Hope it, hope it uh, brings some value well, to the audience. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that's a great point. And, but I, I would say the other explanation that pops to my mind is that your, your body's sleep system is dynamic and flexible. It's designed to be adaptive. <laughs> so if you, if you only get two hours of sleep one night, right, you are, your body is going to want to make up for it later, especially even if it doesn't show up in hours of sleep necessarily, right? It will show up in quality. Like your body knows to prioritize higher quality. I mean, that's, that's a little bit subjective, but like you, your body prioritizes deep sleep before lighter stages of sleep, just every, every single night, it knows to do that. Right. And so if you are lacking sleep, right. One night for whatever reason, you're like, your body's got it. <laughs> your body knows how to sleep. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> your body's got it under control. And when you have insomnia, nothing is broken with your body's ability to sleep literally nothing. <laughs> Everything is perfectly fine physiologically. So you have to be able to trust that your sleep system is going to adjust to those perfectly normal, very unpleasant, but perfectly normal nights where you get, you get terrible, awful sleep. If you think about it, this is anything, any like new parent or new mom certainly knows you have a lot of nights of really terrible sleep. The vast majority of them, however, don't go on to develop insomnia. They're resilient to that very difficult stretch of time and they sort of figure it out. They get back, they get back onto things. So I think that's really, again, it goes back to this, like not catastrophizing or sleep. And in fact, even befriending it or normalizing it. And it's, that is not just this like pie in the sky. Nice. That's nice for Daniel and Nick to say thing, but it, it is utterly pragmatic. <laughs> there, it, the, no matter how poorly you've slept, Thinking more about it and analyzing it and worrying about it can only make it worse. There's no like universe where that gets better by thinking more about it and analyzing it more. So I think letting your sleep system, which is designed again, designed to be adaptive, because if you think about it, we, we probably wouldn't survive, have survived as a species. If when we lay down in our caves to go to bed, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago in the Savannah. If we were like, well, I didn't get much sleep, so I really need to sleep. If your body literally made you sleep for eight hours, you, some tiger is going to walk in and like eat you. <laughs> you need to be able to not sleep sometimes and be flexible for all sorts of purposes, survival included. So your sleep system is designed to be flexible and resilient. And I think learning to trust that is a huge part. And it's hard. Like you said, it's, and I know, like you and I know, we've spent decades talking to people who have had severe, like, awful insight. And I, I don't wish that on my worst enemy. Like it is one of the worst things. Like talking to people who have severe insomnia is, I mean, it's, it's hard just listening to it, but going through it is brutal. So it's definitely not to downplay that at all, but your body is capable of sleeping and wants to sleep. And so it's about how do we get out of the way 
of that process through very, very well-intentioned ideas. We, we want to jump in and help and like fix it, but it only makes it worse. And so it's about kind of stepping back and getting out of the way and letting our body do what it know it needs to do. Yeah. And I really want to add something to this, which is like, you know, you said that the sleep system is flexible and your body, your brain knows exactly what it's doing. We don't actually need to interfere with it at all. hundred percent agree with that. And here's something that may, may really surprise people when I say this, but in, in many ways, the fact that you're not sleeping when you have insomnia is proof that the brain is working perfectly. It's doing exactly what it's designed to do. It's sort of a feature, not a bug. And, 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 and some, some, somebody who hears this may say, like, what are you talking about? Like, you know, I'm afraid my brain is broken. Something must be wrong. But here's the thing. Our brains are designed to keep us awake when there's some type of threat around mm -hmm. us, when we think, right? When we think there's potentially something that can harm us, right? Now, why, why then does it keep us awake when there's nothing, obviously, there's nothing in surround, surrounding us that could be harmful to us at all, the person with insomnia will say. Well, here's the thing we talked about earlier that we define insomnia as like a struggle that comes from a kind of misclassification or misunderstanding in the brain where our brain has misclassified being awake as a threat or danger. Mm -hmm. So when it's kind of nighttime, our brain goes like, oh no, we might not sleep. This, this thing can attack us. We might, we should be awake. Then it, it keeps us awake. So the wakefulness there is actually a sign that the brain is doing exactly what it's designed for. It's working perfectly well. It's keeping us awake when it thinks there's a threat. The problem is that there's been just a misunderstanding. There is no mm. real threat. There's just a perceived threat. But, you know, for anyone, I just want to really say this because people often think my brain is broken, something is wrong with me, but actually everything that's happening is proof that things are working exactly as designed. Yeah, that's that's a great, that's a really great point. And that it's, the, the onus is on us to be sort of mindful about what are we teaching our brain, which goes back to that, that attitude and set of behaviors around striving and problem solving and thinking analytically, all those things that help so much in most of our life. When, when you, when sort of, when you've started struggling with sleep and you've even unconsciously or without awareness started turning sleep and wakefulness into an enemy, all those things are perpetuating that mistaken belief that not sleeping perfectly or, or not sleeping that much is a danger, which becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where you get more and more afraid and then you sleep less and less, or you struggle more and more with your sleep. Okay. Well, we, we are, we've been talking quite a bit. Let's do, let's do one more each. So if you got, you got to reach into your bag, like what's your, what's your final kind of tip or suggestion or, or even just comment for, for the high achiever who is, who is struggling with sleep in, in one way or another. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I will say, you know, I wrote down five, but, you know, as we went in all this very, I think, nice sidetracks, we won't be able to get all those. So, so I'm going to choose the one that is kind of like maybe a little bit different from from the, the the theme, which was all around kind of control. Now, so the one I'll choose is that the the, the when I think of like a high achiever that, that, I, that I engage with, one thing that I often hear is that this person goes, I'm not the type of person who takes like medication, I'm going to do this the healthy way. Mm. And, and so I, and I've heard that exercise is good. So that, you know, I have to exercise is good. Yoga is good. A healthy uh, diet is good. And taking that to sort of an extreme, like, you know, going for like, you know, ultra marathon runs and like, you know, y y joining like three yoga studios and like, you know, counting calories and like perfecting their diet. So taking like a healthy lifestyle to like an extreme and in order to like achieve sleep is, is something that I often see uh, with like the, the high achieving insomnia. So I want to mention that one. And the, sorry. So, and the implication though, is that even if you get some benefit from your diet being 10% better or you exercising 50% more or whatever, like there are benefits to sleep for that. It's going to be drowned out by this negative side effect of getting even more perfectionistic and effortful about your sleep. 100%. Yeah, it's, it's, that's the point that all these things done are really, again, this effort. It's, it's the intent behind exercise, yoga, or, or, or changing our diet is to achieve sleep, you know, to obtain sleep. And as sleep is this passive natural process, it, it, it becomes the net becomes very unhelpful because it may we become so anxious and hyper aroused and, and there's so much performance anxiety around this that it keeps us from sleeping well, even though 
these things are by themselves kind of nice things. Yeah, the, the net yeah. effect becomes something very tricky. It reminds me of this really calm. I'm sure you've heard this. I used to hear this all the time. This frustration that people who have insomnia or sleep problems have with their their spouse or partner. It's like, oh, you know, my husband, he just like, he hits the head, hits the pillow and he just passes out right away. He doesn't do any of this stuff. Like he doesn't care. There could be a fire engine going off outside and he plays video games right up in the bed and like eats like garbage. And how come he can just like fall asleep? And I'm doing everything right. I'm going all down the checklist. I'm doing all the 125 things on my sleep hygiene checklist. And I can't sleep. And I, I think, I just think that's such a, I mean, that is frustrating. I mean, I, I can, I can empathize with that, but it's such a beautiful illustration of the, what are the actual core dynamics that govern sleep? And it hasn't, it has so little to do with the content of all these little tips and tricks and like things, your sleep hygiene stuff. And it's so much more about the attitude and the motivation behind all these behaviors and ways of thinking. And the reason those people who do all the sleep hygiene stuff wrong can still sleep is because they're getting all the little stuff wrong, but they're getting the one big thing very right, which is they're just not trying. <laughs> they just don't care, which sounds like heresy to someone who's a high achiever and who's a perfectionist and who's, you know, super ambitious, but like being kind of lazy and like kind of a slob when it comes to your sleep hygiene <laughs> is actually beneficial because they're getting out of the way. They're just letting their body do what it can do. So I think that's, it's a hard, it's a hard sell, but to some extent you need to embrace a little bit of that. I always think of like the dude from the Big Lebowski, you know, he just like walks into the grocery store and his uh, bathrobe gets a thing a half and a half. You, you gotta, you gotta cultivate a little bit of your, the, the dude, you gotta let the dude out a little bit when it comes to sleep. Anyway, go be, go be a high achiever for 12 hours during the day. But when it comes to nighttime, embrace your inner, your inner dude, I think. <laughs> 100%. And you know, a different way of saying what you said about the spouse that sleeps so well is, is to look at how they do that. And why I, I often encourage people to think about, you know, asking that person, the spouse who sleeps so well, how they do that. And, and, and I often say that because they will share the secret with you. They will share the secret to like sleeping really well with you. And then, you know, they imagine going like, hey, you know, hey, Bob, like, how do you sleep so well? How do you do that? And 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 their, their spouse who sleeps so well will go, sh they will shrug and go like, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, and that's kind of, that is the secret, right? That, that lack of effort. But there's another thing I also want to comment on real quick. And it's like, as you said, I, we, you know, I hear this very often, a person who's kind of upset at their spouse or friend or whatnot. And we, you know, in, in our space, we, we call that sleep envy. That person has sleep mm. envy, right? And th th there is a teaching point here that I think can be really, really uh, nice. And it's when you're envious then you're basically saying that something isn't right. You know, something has been done that isn't fair. You know, you're sort of accusing somebody of unfairness here, like, you know, not. and so, so in a way you're kind of pointing fingers. But if you think about it, like where where's that finger pointed? Because there's nothing outside of yourself that is really having any significant impact on your own sleep like the, the the struggle really comes from ourselves from our from our kind of our own thought patterns and behavior so in a way when you're envious and accuse something of unfairness you're sort of pointing fingers at yourself in a way you're kind of saying like why can't i get this right what's wrong with me like i've tried all these things like I'm, you know etc so that sleep envy in in a way is an expression of something that's so common in our in our in our world which is self criticism you know being harsh on ourselves, like, you know, and, and that then naturally leads to what I think helps honestly more than anything else I, I teach, which is self-kindness, you know, self-love mm. and self-compassion. And, and seeing that for a long time, you may have been really pushing yourself to achieve something that is effortless. And that's an impossible conundrum, you know? So what really helps is to see that I can be more gentle and, 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 and kind to myself and not push myself too much. And that I, again, like that really brings the hyper arousal lower and brings the stakes lower and everything. So that's, you know, self-kindness, super, super helpful. Yeah. I really like that. The last one I'll throw in that I think is, is kind of underrated is one of the, one of the amazing abilities of people who are high, high achievers and strivers generally is that they are pretty good at emotional suppression. I heard a psychologist to say that emotional suppression is a good thing. That one of, those, one of those things that sounds like heresy, right? But no, the ability to like temporarily ignore or suppress a difficult emotion, a difficult thought, whatever it is, in in service of a more important good is actually perfectly fine. It's not a, it's not a bad thing. Right? Now, if that becomes a chronic 
a thing that you're not even aware of and doing constantly, that can become problematic. If you're constantly shoving stuff, you know, into the closet and not addressing things, that's problematic. But to temporarily kind of suppress some kind of difficult emotion, you know, you get angry or something going into a meeting, it's actually a good thing to be able to like push that down a little bit, do your meeting and then come back. And if you need to process that anger later or that fear or whatever it is. So anyway, one of the, I think, characteristics of high achievers is that they are pretty good at this skill of when they're trying to do something, when they're working, when they're, they're pursuing a goal, whether they're an athlete or a CEO or a surgeon or a lawyer or whatever it is, you need to be able to put that stuff aside in order to achieve this more important goal in the moment. The problem is if you, if you never allow that stuff to come back to actually address that stuff, your, your mind still wants you to address those things. <laughs> there are things that your mind thinks are important that you need to deal with and process. And if you spend all day ignoring that stuff and stuffing it down and then have no other outlet to consider or process those things, your mind is going to wait and wait and wait until you finally have a moment where you're not doing something and thinking about something and, and finally like a little bit quiet, which is usually when you're in bed, laying in bed, right? Either before you fall asleep or in the middle of the night at like 2 a.m., and then it's like, ah, finally, I've got you to myself. Remember all those things you said you would get to later? All those like fears and worries and those painful like thoughts and memories. Like, guess what, buddy? Here they are. Like now's the time. And it's going to, your brain's going to throw all of those at you in that when you have those quiet moments where you're finally not preoccupied with something. So it's perfectly okay to be good at sort of uh, suppressing or deferring difficult emotions or thoughts throughout the day in service of, of some bigger goal. But the counterpart to that is you need to build in time to actually deal with those things. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be in therapy every single day or, <laughs> or even do some kind of like really sophisticated, complicated sort of emotional processing. A really great habit that I've found to be really helpful, especially for insomnia, but for other things is what I call scheduled worry. It's not, I don't call it that. It, it's an established kind of technique and it's, I, I won't go into all the details, but it's basically you set aside some time, typically in the evenings, the early evenings, not right before bed, but and you just take out a pen and paper and you just write down everything you're worried about. So difficult, like thoughts, things. And it could be from the tiniest thing, like you forgot to get bananas at the grocery store to nuclear war. Like it could be anything on the spectrum. So difficult worries, how you're feeling. You don't, you don't deal with them. It's not problem solving. You're just getting them out of your head. You're putting on paper and you're saying, yes, brain, like I heard you. I hear these things. I know you're concerned about these things. I'm writing them down. I am aware of them. And that's it. You spend 10 or 15 minutes, you just transcribe all these worries, thoughts, difficult emotions, you put them down on paper, and then that's it. You don't have to do anything with it. You can throw it away. <laughs> but if you get in the habit of doing this regularly, you're gonna, it's going to help so much with that thing a lot of especially high achievers struggle with when it comes to sleep, which is this like storm of thoughts and worries and to-dos that like the minute you get into bed or the minute you wake up in the middle of the night, your brain's just pouring worries and concerns on you. Part of that is again, you've been, you've been saying no later, later, later to your brain all day. <laughs> and you haven't, you haven't made good on that promise. So if you can build in a little time toward the end of your day, but before sleep to let all that stuff come out, you're going to have a lot less of those thoughts and worries. It's not, you're not going to eradicate them, <laughs> but it's going to be much easier, more, more manageable. So there's this technique called scheduled worry. You can look it up. I, I, I've written a bunch about it, but that can be very helpful, especially if you fall into the kind of overthinker subtype of high achievers <laughs> and you really struggle with the, the worries um, and the fears in, in bed. I think this scheduled worry um, can be really helpful. I don't know if it's something you um, have used a lot, Daniel, or if you recommend, but. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you, you know, you, I learned this from you and I, I've recommended it a lot of times and and I just want to share something to sort of emphasize why I think this is, it's so helpful to kind of show our brain that we're listening rather than trying to constantly, you know, suppress uncomfortable thoughts and emotions. And so the way I think of it is that, you know, thoughts and emotions are basically our brain's way of like communicating with us. They're kind of communication tools, you know, and a thought is like a message. I think of it as a message, like you, you can get a text message, you can actually see what the message is about, right? Or whereas uh, an emotion is more like a signal, like you can get a signal on your phone, like zzz, zzz. you don't know exactly mm. what it's about, but it's kind of something wants your attention, something like that, right? But both are there to communicate with us. Now, with that in mind, we can we can really learn, I think, from 
from in, you know interpersonal communication. Like, let's say you have a friend who's going to, you know, they're going to buy a timeshare in Thailand because they had a great time there. And you're like, I don't think that's a good idea. And you're like, hey, friend, are you sure about this? And your friend is just like, yeah, 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 whatever. I, I have other things to do. And you're like, they didn't hear me, but you love your friend. Mm -hmm. you, you have the rest in interest. So it's like, you really, now you're going to be like, I really have to get this across. Now you call them and they're like, they don't take your call. Oh my gosh. You're thinking like, I really, I need to tell them this. So now you kind of go to their door and you're like knock on the door and you're like, hey, you cannot buy that timeshare. It's a terrible idea. And maybe let's just take for the sake of the example here that your friend now says, no, no, I, you know, I thought some more about it and I'm not going to do it. And then immediately your need to warn your friend is like dissipate. It's gone. There's absolutely no need to, to warn your friend anymore because like they heard you, they listened and, you know, the message was delivered. So. I think the same thing plays out inside of us. Like when, when our brain has this message for us, the more we try to suppress it, the more it's going to be like, no, you need to hear this. But then when we actually schedule some, some time to listen and just, again, put things down on paper, not to problem solve, but just to kind of show our brain, like everything's been heard, super helpful. I love it. And it, it, it just, it aligns so well with the way I think about not just insomnia, but, but sort of emotional health generally. In fact, I, I call my, my blog and my newsletter, my website, the friendly mind, because I kind of think that's the whole secret is to realize that no matter what a particular thought or emotion or, or feeling feels like, whether it feels good, like joy or happiness, or whether it feels bad, like, like worry or, or fear, your mind is your friend and it's trying to help you. It always has your best intentions at heart. It might not always be right. It might be confused, just like a friend could give you bad advice. And it might seem a little annoying sometimes because it keeps giving it to you, but it, it's not an enemy. Nothing you experience internally is an enemy whether that's, you know, being awake in the middle of the night or worrying or whatever it is, it's not an enemy. It might feel bad, but just because it feels bad doesn't mean it is bad. And so taking this, I love your, this idea of this kind of interpersonal approach to difficult thoughts and emotions and thinking them as thinking of them as messages from a good friend who we definitely want to listen to. We don't necessarily want to just take orders, but we always want to listen to. And so I, I think it's a wonderful way to end a discussion of, of insomnia, but, but also just sort of emotional health and kind of well-being generally. So that's awesome, Daniel. Thank you so much. Anytime. Loved speaking with you, Nick, and uh, I look forward to, to chatting with you soon again. Where can people go if they want to learn more about you and, and your work? Yeah, yo, so I think the best uh, place is really our YouTube channel. It's it's called The Sleep Coach School. If you just search that on, on YouTube, you'll find it. I also put out some content on Twitter or X and Instagram as well. But I, I'd say start with the YouTube channel. That's That's where the kind of you can get a lot of really, really great education. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel.